Welcome back. Thank you for watching Module 1. This is Module 2 of Creating Windows Phone and Windows Store Apps with Monogame. Uh, we got Andy, I'm Tom. And I keep forgetting to do the Remember introductions. Us? And uh, I promise <laughs> not to touch my neck in this module. I've been, I get in trouble for making noises on the microphone. So <laughs> uh, if I touch the neck, I need everybody in the chat to yell at me. Yeah. Um, we, uh, we apparently had some questions in the forums. Um, Brian Peake and some of the other um, subject matter experts are um, answering those pretty good, but we'll cover a couple now. First one that uh, we covered about 3D formats. Um, we cover FBX and .x files just like XNA. Right. We actually use an external tool called Asset Importer, right. and uh, I so, believe that supports other formats, but I'm not sure if Monogame yeah. will actually bring in Collada or any of those. Do you know? You know, it, there's a, we added a special uh, importer that's the open asset importer that's separate from the FBX and the X importer. Actually, the FBX and the X importer, under the hood, call the open asset importer to do the work. If you actually change the importer to open asset importer, it'll support everything that, it technically supports everything that, that oh, the open asset importer supports, which is things to like Doom models, Doom model formats. Oh, cool. Yeah, it supports, everything you can think of is there, it's crazy. We haven't tested all of them, um, so your mileage may vary on how they work, but they're there, and uh, we we did it that way because it's like you know what, let's support more we can. You know, we didn't want to get into the business of figuring out FBX and figuring out uh, uh, X files ourselves. So we use this library, and it's fantastic. It's open source. It's great. If you're not going to be uh, using Monogame, you should definitely at least check out that library for your own pipelines. Uh, another question was, will we be supporting compute shaders? Uh, right now, we are uh, an XNA API, and XNA has no concept of compute shaders. Right. So right now, we do not. Um, it's one of those things that's a potential future thing. We won't right. be covering it in this talk or in the, in the follow-up talk in a few months. We've had people uh, submit pull requests for that to the, the starting of those things. We haven't accepted them mostly because we don't know the best way to integrate it, and we don't know if really if that's beyond what the scope of Monogon should be. Maybe the, if somebody wants to write a compute shader, uh, uh, a cross-platform compute shader API, they can write it as a separate project, and we can just provide the hooks so that it can play well together. And instead of trying to take that on. It's a big project, and we, we're trying to avoid making it bigger and harder to maintain. But it's something we're always talking about. It just it, We'll see how things turn out. If computer shaders are being used more and more in the game industry, and it might be something we just need to adopt. Okay, so I think those are the questions that were unanswered. Uh, keep asking them, and uh, subject matter experts will try and cover uh, what you've got. Uh, the so, ones they don't, we'll try to cover as well. So on to making a Windows Phone game with Mono Game, part one. There's two sessions we're going to do. Tom's going to do the basics mm -hmm. of the game in the first one, and then we're going to start adding some of the pretty stuff in the second 50 minutes. So over to you, Tom. All right, thanks, Andy. So let's go with a, a little bit of an overview of the module. So uh, what we're going to start with is we're going to talk about the game. And in our case, we're going to talk about a little bit like, how do you pick a game? You know, how do you pick what you're going to work on? Uh, we're going to talk about what we picked, and we're going to talk about, you know, our twist on that pick. Um, we're then going to walk you through setting up a project, setting up the basic gameplay, and explain some of those elements. Um, we're then going to show you rendering a scene. Uh, again, the scene in this case is 2D, so it's simple just to kind of get you acclimated to what's going on there. And then we're going to cover, like, just input, you know, critical to making the game do something from the user. And then we're going to add a little bit of animation by scrolling stuff around a little bit so you can get it. And uh, I notice it says rooms, HUD, and things like that. You'll understand what all that means here in a second. So uh, let's talk about the game. So this is something I think is kind of critical for a lot, a lot of new developers and stuff like that. Uh, how many times have you seen somebody in a game forum say, like, hey, I want to make an MMO? It's like, okay. Every day, Tom. That, if Every you day. If you any forum, somebody there, always wants to write an MMO. Right, right around, especially right around in time when uh, uh, Warcraft was becoming popular, everybody wanted to write an MMO. And I know, I know of only one guy that successfully did that. But other than that, it's really hard to do those kinds of things. So really, it's important when you're picking a game, start simple. Start with something that's achievable, that's realistically achievable. Uh, the, the thing that can hurt you the most is take, hit, hit too high a mark, don't even get close and be frustrated by the experience. So pick something that's achievable and simple. And then after that, add in complexity. You don't have to make it complex to begin with. Start simple and build it up. And you'll get excited as you build it up and add features and you'll be excited about what you're doing. Um, also, don't be, don't be concerned about taking someone's existing concept and putting a twist on it. Um, you know, there are a lot of games out there that are just variants of other games. This happens in all kinds of media, from music to movies and TV. It's just variants of other things. Uh, same thing with games. You know, it's perfectly fine to say, hey, I love Minecraft, but I'd like to do it with guns. <laughs> and that's it's something a great that, game. It's a great game, Guncraft. You should check it out. It's on Steam. 
And uh, it's something definitely, it's, it's fine to do those kinds of things. Don't feel like you're not being created enough. The creative process is always an evolution. It's not usually, it's rarely that it's an, you know, a revolution where it's like all of a sudden something out of nowhere comes out that no one's seen before. And I think it's important to say that um, unless you are Notch, you are probably not going to make $2.3 billion with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the game you wrote. Um, and if you look back, it wasn't Notch's first game. Um, if you look back at, uh, I like to use the uh, Angry Birds, Rovio, as a good example. Uh, everybody looks at Angry Birds and thinks, God, look at that. Those game guys got so lucky with their first game. Um, go back and look at their Wikipedia page. It yeah. wasn't their first game. Not they were around, for like, long they were around yep. for like 10 years, I think, before, before exactly. uh, Angry Birds um, hit for them. And, you know, they tweaked, their, they tweaked what they were doing. They, they tried different things. Um, so it's important to realize that you're not going to go out there and... Um, Though it's easy now to get a game onto uh, any of the mobile or the desktop stores, that doesn't mean you're going to make the million dollars. So um, don't aim so high. It, it's quite okay to make another right. Flappy Birds or a Pong clone. Exactly. And you know what? At least be excited about what you're working on. Yeah. If you're working on something that you really love and you're enhancing it and doing something better that you think is a better product, great. As long as you're excited about it, yeah, you might not make a million dollars with it, but you were, it was fun and you did something exciting yeah. and some people saw it and you got a little audience. And if you're really lucky you might hit that, you know, <laughs> that lottery ticket. So, and one of, probably one of the most important things, aside from all this, is actually finish it. Um, it's important to see that you can actually finish a game. If you start it, you don't start something else, and you start something else, you never really finish it. Finishing is like one of the hardest things in game development. Um, it's very easy, it's very exciting when you start a project and things are flowing. At a certain point, you start to get tired of it, you start to get frustrated. Um, being able to finish and push through and finish that project is so important to making sure that uh, um, it, to, it's so important to be able to do that and make sure that you can get it through to the end. And that includes polish, like little details, like sound effects when you touch user interface things, things that we won't have the time for to get into today, but that polish is really important and actually takes a mediocre kind of game and makes it like over the top, makes it very, very exciting. And this is very important, especially we've probably got a lot of students watching or, or people where you, your dream is to be the game programmer. And right now, you know, you're sitting in that nine to five job, you know, doing something that you're not so interested in. And if you want to sell yourself to a game development company, um, it's great to show up with a resume that shows you have 12 years of C++, but uh, as a guy who you know, has had to hire game programmers, there's nothing better than going to your website and seeing those three little games that you've done in your spare time uh, and making them much better than just a graphical demo. Um, so if you've put all the UI work in, and Tom and I joke about this, that nobody likes to be the UI programmer, but you know, so much of your code is being the UI programmer in a small team. Right that you need to actually uh, do that. And so if I see somebody who's done that and put the polish in, that's really gonna help me in you know, offering them jobs. And I know, you know Tom's company, right. you, people are hiring Tom's company to do games. And when you do that, they're gonna come and say, look at that unfinished game on right, your website. Exactly. So it's, finish it's the game, if it's very important. So uh, let's talk about the game that we're gonna build today. So uh, this is probably a game that almost nobody on this, <laughs> that's in the chat has heard or watching this live. Uh, it's called Hunt the Wumpus. It's an old, old game. It, it was created originally in 1972 by a man named Greg, Gregory Yobb. Uh, I think he was the Massachusetts Institute of Technology at the time. He, at the time, there were a lot of mainframe-based games. These games were running on a dark screen with, uh, I guess it was uh, like just a monochrome screen, just text. Um, and this was Some of them the ran on teletypes. You would type it in oh, and it would print crazy. the paper yeah. out of the top. So it was hard to like be excited about graphics those days, but they were still excited. So this is one of the earliest games. He saw a lot of other games based on 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 uh, uh, randomly going through rooms, and he thought he could do something a little bit more interesting with uh, actually making some kind of interesting map. And he ended up doing a map that was kind of mathematical based and things like that. Um, in uh, the but it was still text. He was just describing the room and the directions, and you'd type in where you wanted to go. Uh, the game you use your senses. You basically ran, wandering around these rooms. Um, it will tell you you hear a, 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 wind, a wind coming nearby, and that's telling you that there's a, a pit in one of the rooms around you. You would say that you, you, know, you smell something foul, and that would tell you that, hey, there's a monster in one of the nearby rooms. I think you didn't know which a, one it was. But I think of it as a precursor to Minesweeper. You know, you pick a square. Yeah. It doesn't tell you where the mines are, but it tells you there are some nearby. Yeah, so a very exactly. similar concept. It was something like that, but it was more like an adventure game. You were hunting around the, these dungeons. You were looking for the monster, but first you had to go find the bow and arrow so you could actually attack the monster. If you ran into the monster, walked into the room that the monster was in, without the bow and arrow, you would instantly die. So you were trying to avoid him while finding the, the bow and arrow in the random room. 
once you had the bow and arrow and you got in a room next to the monster, you had to figure out what room he was in, so you, what direction to shoot in. If you shot in the right direction, then you would kill him and you'd win. If you shot in the wrong direction, the monster would move to another room, you'd lose the bow and arrow and have to go hunt it down again, and that would continue until either you fell into a pit and died, or the monster got you. Um, it had a complex map, as I was saying, and it was, it was ported to a bunch of platforms. I think the first graphical, ver the first version I saw, I think, was on the TI-99 home computer. Very, very You're old, old thing, Tom, yeah. aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. The beard. So uh, that's the first graphical one, but the one that I remember the most as a kid was I had a small handheld uh, game, I think was made by Mattel, that was like an LCD game, those old classic LCD games. And it was basically Hunt the Wumpus done as a Dungeons and Dragons kind of theme. Um, and I played that thing for a really long time. I never know what happened to it, but you know, I recently remembered it and it inspired me to kind of do this. I was excited about it, so that's why I picked it. So let's talk about our version of it. So I didn't want to do Dungeons and Dragons. That's real, not really my thing at this point. So I thought, let's use an alien theme. So it's alien theme. So instead of a monster, you have an alien. Instead of a bow and arrow, we have the... The uh, flamethrower. <laughs> the flamethrower, you know, the mortal enemy of the alien, the flamethrower. Um, it's simple grid map, even though the original was a complex map. I went with a simple grid because the Mattel game had it, and also it's easier to explain. And it, you know, it leaves something open for the user to experiment with later. You can easily switch the, switch the map around and keep the same kind of gameplay. Uh, we're just going to do 2D graphics. Adding the third dimension to a game makes it very complex. Uh, we recommend starting with 2D, especially if you're new. Um, it's, uh, it saves you a lot of time, and you, even though it's 2D, you can still make it feel 3D. There's a lot of tricks there. You'll kind of get a feel of that, that when you look at the art. In this case, we're building it on Windows Phone first. Uh, you know, when you'll, I can walk around and have it in my pocket and play it and show it to people. So it's always fun to have it on a phone like that because it's mobile. You can bring it to people. And uh, because it's Windows Phone, it's touch input instead of text. So uh, it's, it's different from the original, but it's my twist on it, and uh, I think it'll be fun. So let's talk about, let's set up the project and, and get some initial gameplay in place. So uh, we're going to start by creating the project. You know, uh, we're starting with the uh, Mono Game Windows Phone 8.1 project template. You know, later we'll talk about porting it over to other platforms. We'll talk about other project templates. Uh, then we're just going to do a, a couple things I normally do is like I like to edit the package ma manifest on that, which kind of defines like the description of the game and the name of the game, so that when you deploy it onto a device, it has a name and instead of like game one. Um, then you know some other little things like disabling the status bar on the phone. If you have a full screen game, there's a little status bar on a Windows phone that pops down. You don't want that over your game, so I'll just show you quickly how to do that and get that out of the way. And then we're going to do a test deployment of the thing and run it to make sure that everything's working before we move on to the other modules or the other slide. So let's go ahead and jump over to code. Under Visual Studio here. Right, where's my Visual Studio? There's my Visual Studio. There we are. All right, so let's start by creating a new project here. And uh, I'm already doing it wrong. Let's go to full screen. Give you a little bit more space so you can see. So new project. So again, Andy showed you a little bit about the templates. Uh, where are we here? There we go. So Andy talked a little about the templates. We're going to use the same one I guess that he used before, which is the, window, the Mono Game Windows Phone 8.1 project. And I'm going to put this somewhere on the desktop because that makes sense. What's our path here? Yeah, it should be fine. I'm just going to call it Wumpus. Mostly because that's what I called it before. No, I don't want a folder. Why do I want a folder? Yeah. Uh, no, you need to oh, pick, yeah, yeah, I don't need to do that. Desktop ah, and then type that's what I did wrong. There. See, I'm already messing it up. This is, uh, this, is Tom's, this is only Tom's second time in Visual Studio. Yeah, um, I'm new to this. <laughs> Bear with me. Great yeah, director for solution. I don't normally do that for, for this case. It's fine. So here it is. Pop, Visual Studio popped up here. We have our tree. We have content. Uh, one interesting thing is you, uh, you know, the content projects in here, and I'll show you that in a minute. Let's make sure first it actually deploys. So let's go ahead and go. I'm going to start with the 5.5 inch emulator because, for other reasons, I'll tell you later about that. Let's make sure it runs. So I already had the emulator open, so it popped up nice and quick. 
So that's a great thing about the emulator there. Um, I should have pointed there out we that go. Uh, Back to if you're new to um, phone development, the, uh, the emulator emulates all of the different phone sizes, um, mm -hmm. uh, all from that same thing. And you can emulate touch. You can emulate rotation. You can emulate the uh, mm -hmm. gyroscopes by... You can emulate multi-touch. Um, you know, yeah. uh, there's a lot of things you can emulate there, which is really useful. And it really, if you've done mobile development on other platforms, the emulator for Windows Phone is so, so good compared to the other platforms. It, it's, it's amazing. It really is. Godsend to have that. So we have it up and running. So good. So let's go ahead and stop that. Uh, stop. Okay. So uh, now that we have that, let's talk. So we originally talked about we're going to jump back and edit the package manifest. So I'm going to do that real quick here. So you just double click on it and you know display game display name. Let's just call it. Uh, we decided I was going to call it Alien Hunter because that sounded awesome. And description, we'll just put a little description in here. A lot of the stuff that comes in the app manifest is stuff that appears in the store description and you set the permissions and, and various kind of global things about your, your game. Um, and Windows Store apps have a very, a very similar concept. Um, and Tom's going to write an essay here about it. <laughs> there we yeah, go. Fun. And, uh, Maybe yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe one day so, we'll finish this game and actually put it out on the store for everybody to play. I'm, uh, it'll probably be out in the store before we get done. Somebody will be like, cool, I can make 99 cents on this. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just going to tell it that we support landscape and landscape flipped. Yeah, I, you know, I don't think you have to do that, but I normally do just because. Um, uh, and then that's basically the direction I put it. Really, I don't have to change much more there. So uh, then we're going to go ahead and disable the status bar. So how I did this, uh, there are different ways to do it, but how I did this is I did it in here. So here, and this is where I'm going to jump over to my pre-done code notes because I'm going to forget things and that would not be great. So that's my code there for hiding the status bar. And in this case, there's something interesting to talk about here. Oh, home's in a different position than I expect. Um, Visual Studio here will give you like this little thing saying, oh, that's a different thing. Yay. Love C Sharp, that's why that's great. It'll give you this warning. Because this call is not a way to execution of the current method continues before the call, it's just a warning. It's perfectly fine for it to be there. I don't need to wait on it. It's fine for it to be doing it while I'm starting up the game. Uh, but it's a, it's a nice warning to see. And we can run it again and we can see that when it runs, it comes up here and status bar goes away. There you go. Awesome. Come on. I should also point out that when you're running in the emulator, you're actually running a fully hardware accelerated DirectX application. Uh, yeah. So that, that, this, uh, that's not software rendering. Uh, the Hyper-V technology really does virtualize the CPU and the GPU. Mm -hmm. And so you actually get fantastic performance as well. Uh, Right. As Tom said, there are other emulators on where the uh, it's a software emulated thing, and it's the performance. It's gonna be painful. Like it. Yeah. So let's talk about some gameplay. So uh, the core of the Hunt the Wumpus game is basically the rooms. You know, you're moving from room to room, and that's kind of like the core element. In our case, we don't need we're not we're not going to build something with a big uh, class hierarchy where you have a room and has a draw method or anything like that. I prefer just to use keep the room as just a data object. So it's just going to keep. Uh, data that I need for rendering, for gameplay. It's going to keep ind indices into the different rooms that are connected. It's going to keep some flags for, like, is there a trap in the room? Uh, it's, and it could also keep more complex state, like if you wanted to have different kind of elements that can be in there, if you wanted to randomize uh, different graphics, you could pre-do the randomization, store the information so at runtime you don't have to do that all the time. There's a lot of things you can do there and expand, but basically the gameplay of the room is very straightforward. So I'm just going to drag and drop that thing in. Andy told me a great little trick. That's why he's around. It says that I can just drag and drop it into here. Let's see how it does it. You have to drag it to the actual project. Oh, that's the trick. I see. There you go. Awesome. Even this old dog can learn a new trick. <laughs> so, basically, the, this class is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, it's room class. We store an index. That's the 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 ID of the room, basically or a, the index into an array. We store the index into the, the other rooms. I don't store pointers to them because that actually adds like some more complexity to the garbage collector, has to figure things out and stuff. And in general, I try to avoid that when I can, when it's straightforward. In this case, it's a very simple game, it was fine. Uh, it could go either way, I just decided to do it this way. So, and then it keeps the different room directions. We're going with a, 
north, south, east, west kind of layout, very simple, but you could easily change this to have all kinds of different structures or even make it flexible, like it could go in northeast, northwest, or any direction you like. For the uh, mathematicians amongst you, this is essentially a graph. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a, exactly. Yeah, a set of nodes with connections between them. Uh, right. And uh, those interested should go check out the Wampus page on Wikipedia where they talk about the map that uh, the original guy used, which was a flattened icosahedron or something. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I read that and said, nope, I'm going to do a grid. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we sort of flag that it has a trap, and then we have a simple constructor here that initializes our variables, and we keep everything else kind of private because we don't want people changing them around. No reason that needs to be changed around. So the room is pretty straightforward there. Um, so next, let's talk about the map. So the higher level from the room is the overall map. Then I decided to put a lot of our game state and our game and our some of our gameplay logic into the map class itself. The map class actually uses uh, basically a very simple form of procedural content generation. That's something that you've heard of recently, probably in other games. Things like Minecraft use procedural content generation to build like a randomized map. It guesses where you know hills and valleys are, and trees and water and things like that, and just generates something randomly. We're doing the same thing, just a very very simplified version of that. The map keeps it just a simple flat array of rooms. I do the simple math to figure out the room for the neighbors. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, we calculate the, we pre-calculate connections so that the room can see that oh the. Each room knows what its neighbors are. We pre-calculate that when we're building the map. And we generate some locations for singular types. In this case, like, where's the weapon at? Um, it's better to have that than, since the weapon doesn't have a lot of state, we just keep an index of what room the weapon is in. We don't actually try to have a weapon class or anything like that, but you could take it that direction if there's a lot more complexity. Um, so it's like weapon and the monster and things like that. Very straightforward stuff. So let's jump back over to here to the code. So again, because this is kind of boilerplate kind of stuff here, I went in kind of complex. I didn't want to type it all out. I just have a little CS file here. I'm going to drop in that has the, the map code in here, and we'll walk through it a little bit. So the map keeps this private random in here. And uh, basically, since it's procedurally generated, we can have a randomizer that we use to randomly put things down. But we also like initialize it with an initial seed that is, that is used to start the map up, um, and error the randomizer up. And by having an initial seed, it means we can reproduce the same map over and over again. So if we actually were trying to debug something, we'd just give the random the same seed every single time and it'd generate the same map every time, which is useful, especially if you're trying to debug something. You don't want it to change around on you all the time. Um, which is actually the trick that something like Minecraft uses. It's uh, yeah. Each chunk of the Minecraft world is actually created from a fixed seed. And, mm. uh, and if you're running the versions where you can type in a number at the beginning, uh, if you give your friend the same number, they will have the same Minecraft exactly. world. And the whole thing is generated from one magic number. Yeah, it's, it's pretty powerful. And there are a lot of games coming out that take advantage of that concept. Uh, so we keep a simple flat array of the rooms here, right there in code. Nothing special. I could have used a multi-dimensional array. There's a reason I didn't. I don't remember now, but I just did it this way. It's fine. It can be done in any ways, uh, lots of different ways. So I keep the rows and columns. I don't really use anything for it, but it's it's fine. I just built it that way. What the index of what the alien room is. I could have actually kept a struct for the the definition of the room and made it more abstract. But in this case, they're just indices into an array. It's fine. No big deal. Uh, player room index. Uh, a little helper here as a prob you know as a as a getter you know, it returns the room from the index. And then another little helper here that you give it an index and, uh, you know, it returns the room just for any generic room. So here we're talking about the seed. So the map gets passed in a seed to initialize itself, and I'll show you how that gets done. We generate the random. We then decide, I kind of fixed it to 10 rows, 10 columns, because that's where the Mattel game, you know, originally did, um, the, the original Wumpus game that I played on the, the handheld. Uh, but you could make this variable. You could easily extend the game to let the user choose how big you know, of a map to generate, and a lot of things yep. like that. And I've seen variations that have done that. So there's a little bit of complex code here, but not too much. You know, it it uh, creates the array of rooms, it loops through here, and then it basically, uh, at this point, basically it decides how I'm going to, it ca here it's calculating basically the index into the other rooms. And it's just a little bit of math there to figure out like, okay, what's the room that's north, south, and some handling for to make sure you don't go off the edges. The map is closed, so on the outside edge of the walls, you can't wrap around to the other side and we don't want to go outside the map. So and, it's just calculating the- And in that case, we have, a, we have a branch between every room. There are, there are no closed doors in, yeah. uh, in the alien spaceship. Yeah. Yes, uh, but you would think that you'd put some doors in there with an alien running around, but the, you know, no. the engineers there were not very smart. It's uh, something uh, to add later. Tom. Exactly. Well, that's something open for people to expand. So uh, then we create a room, assign those indices, and assign it to the array, and that's it. Uh, the next thing is, and the more procedural stuff, is we need to randomly put down some traps in the room. 
in our case, the trap is, for some reason, there are bear traps on this alien spaceship. I don't know why, but, you know, that's what we picked. Maybe that's because you're a bear, Tom, since... Uh, what? <laughs> um, we, <laughs> the, the player is obviously a bear since they tread in the bear traps. You know, we don't show the player it could be yes. a bear, for all we know. But, uh, <laughs> so it generates a bunch of traps here. It just, we decided that, uh, you know, I use the row count as the number of traps, so at least you'd... You know, if everything worked out perfectly, every row in the, in the map would have one trap. But they get placed randomly. The random's not that great, but it, it does a good job. So we randomly pick a room. We, we randomly give it a trap. And it means that sometimes it hits doubles, and you might have less or, you know, less traps than the original. But it works out okay. Um, we place the weapon. I'll show you that code. It's at a separate little function in here for a reason, and you'll figure that out later. Uh, so then we randomly pick the mon put the monster in a room. You know, uh, so where do we put that guy? You know, we... We use a little bit of link Q here, which I call it link Q. You call it link. I've heard differences. I don't know what's right, but I call it link Q. So there's a little link statement here that uh, loops through and says, looks for every room here. If it doesn't have a trap and it, it isn't the weapon room, you know, you know, it returns those types. And we dump them into an array. So that gives these rooms where the monster could potentially be, be potentially placed. And then it goes through and uh, uh, says, okay, we'll randomize that list to pick an index and then pick the room and say, okay, well, that's the room the alien's going to be in. Uh, One thing we should point out about using uh, Link here is that uh, Link is uh, often not friendly for your garbage collector. Um, it's yeah. the sort of thing that uh, is fantastically powerful to do something like that. And the best time to do it is during startup. Um, by yep. all means, during your content processing or during startup, use whatever is good for you. But um, using things that generate garbage or may not be the most efficient uh, should probably never be called during your update or draw. Right. So uh, use it with discretion. Right. And we do hear the same thing, basically, for picking where the player starts. You know, a little link statement that makes sure that, hey, I'm not placing the player in a trap to start with or in the same room with the weapon or, you know, in the same room with the alien to begin with because that would be kind of failure cases in a lot of times. We store the index. The place the weapon. The place the weapon does the same kind of thing. It looks for trapless rooms, rooms without traps, and puts puts the weapon index into that room. So basically, we've at the end of this, it's basically laid out the map. The map is done. It's laid out. We don't have to do it again. This all kind of happens at startup. See and I'm going to guess you put that in a method because you're going to call it from somewhere else. Yes, yes, I am. So uh, in fact, I guess I can do that right now. Let's just do that right now. What? No. Never show that dialog. There we go. So, uh, actually, you know what? We're here. Let's go ahead and... Actually, no, I'm going to cover that here in a second. So we'll go back to that. So, uh, gameplay player movement. So, so the player movement, the, the, the player moves around the map, and we decided to get in the map class would be the one to coordinate the, all those movements. You know, the, the connection data is stored in the rooms anyways, and we have very simple callbacks uh, for, that allow us to do animation and deal with gameplay events when you, the player does move around. And uh, by putting it all there, it also kind of adds the ability to add these different topologies and connections that we talked about. So let's take a look at a little bit of that. So uh, I'm going to cut and paste my code here. And I'm running a little long, so I'll oh, explain I think this we'll too be, much. Uh, I think we'll be fine. All right. Andy says we're fine, so I believe him. So, um, bam. All right. So... So what we did is I did a simple thing here, just a simple function that moves the player. You know, uh, it takes a callback delegate here so that the caller can get information to like, hey, did I actually change rooms? What room did I move into? Everything else. So it takes the current room, says, hey, if the, if in the current player's current room is the, if the north room is not negative one, these are the magic numbers Andy yes. hates, <laughs> but I don't mind them and it's a very simple game, it's fine. Uh, if it's not negative one means there's no north room, then call the callback, let it know it's changing, and then... Uh, change the index to the new player room. Very simple. The other ones do the same thing, just for different directions. So, so if you have a change to a different topology, then obviously it's... Uh, yeah, you'll change it around. The code is not fully open that we support uh, uh, yeah. an, an open number of move this directions or anything. Yeah, so yeah. it's not quite as yeah. straightforward. As yeah, and it, it, again, it, it's there for you to experiment with. We'll have this stuff up on GitHub, and you'll be able to see yeah. it later. So let's talk about... Let's get the more exciting part, rendering the scene. So uh, rendering here, we're going to start with rendering rooms. I mean, the game is you're looking at the room that you're currently in and what's in the room and the connections that you have. So for rendering, we basically use Sprite Batch. Sprite Batch is kind of a higher level 
you know, support that XNA had originally that Monogame has as well, that basically lets you, um, say, draw these sprites and it takes care of efficiently batching them together and rendering them as one, as one draw call in a lot of cases. So the, the um, background here is, is, as probably most of you know, if you've uh, ever looked into D uh, DirectX or OpenGL rendering is, mm -hmm. everything's a triangle. Um, it doesn't matter what you're drawing to the screen. Uh, what you draw is a triangle. So when you're drawing a two-dimensional sprite, uh, which is just a rectangle, it really is two triangles. Mm -hmm. And um, graphics cards are most efficient when you give them a lot of work to do. If you say, here is a model with 5,000 triangles, that is far more efficient than saying, here's triangle one, could you draw that? Here's right. triangle two, could you draw that? So when we're drawing models in a first-person shooter, it's great because you're throwing big models with 100 things. But when you're drawing sprites, as you'll see from Tom's yeah. code, you say, draw this sprite over here. Now draw this sprite over here. And if you sent them two triangles at a time, um, especially on older hardware, what you find is after about 100 sprites, it slows yes. down. And then you go and look at the specs online, and it says that your you know, ATI GPX 420 can draw 20 million triangles a second. And you think, well, why can I only draw 100? And, and this is why. Right. And so what Sprite Batch does, as Tom said, is uh, when you call the draw method, it doesn't really draw it. It's kind of a dirty little secret. Yeah. It's, it hides it away somewhere, and it says later on, I'm going to draw all these triangles together. So right. uh, the, the batch word is kind of key there. Right, the batch is the key there. And yeah, it's, it's amazing, but it's, it's, some, it's faster to draw, you know, 100, 5,000 triangle, yep. you know, meshes than 100... Individual you know, triangles. little individual triangles. There's a lot of setup and overhead in doing those things, and it's not something you figure out until later, and then you have to kind of rework a lot of your code. And there are some gotchas in there that you'll find, um, and I think Tom probably breaks some of the gotchas. Uh, we have all our sprites in separate textures, uh, and what that means is that Sprite Batch can't really batch them. Um, yeah. And so, you know, a lot of the uh, XNA forums will explain this, that uh, it's use, good to use sprite sheets or texture atlases, as they're officially called. And if you, uh, if you use those, then Sprite Batch can do its work very, very efficiently. Right. And in this case, we didn't because it adds complexity. And for this simple yeah. thing, we don't need to do it. But there's plenty of libraries on there that will automatically, you know, batch these things together. There's, exa there's XNA uh, samples out there for, like, automatically atlasing your, yep. your textures together, generating one big texture. So you can keep all your little individual textures that are friendly for your art team and for you to generate. But it'll batch them all together. And there's tools out there that do it as well. There's lots of options for that. Everything that was available for XNA works with Monogame in that case. So uh, Sprite Batch does all the work for our rendering. In, in our case, our room consists of a ground, a ground texture and then some wall images, a couple different variations so that we have open doors and closed doors, or closed walls and open walls. Uh, another important thing that you don't realize is you need to really design for a virtual screen size. Like you need to pick a, you have to get in your head, okay, what am I gonna design all my art for? And then deal with what happens when I'm on a phone or a desktop or another device that the resolution is completely different. Um, so with that, we're going to scale all our rendering using a matrix, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a second. And uh, we're going to draw, draw the walls based on what the room connections are. We're going to look at the current room, see the connections, and draw the appropriate wall in those cases. So let's go jump down to code. Too much time in a slide. And we'll talk about matrices a little more uh, when I get to the 3D section at the end of Module 4. Um, we mm. kind of purposely avoided doing the math here because that's a whole module in itself and everybody will fall asleep and many of you will not come back afterwards. So exactly. we decided that we are going to skirt around it. Uh, the most important thing to know is that a matrix is a mathematical, rep uh, a mathematical tool that you can use to move and position things in space. Let's just leave it vague like that. Yeah, let's leave it there um, for now. All the mathematicians watching have just cringed. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so let's take a look here at what we have. So uh, in my little folder here with my stuff, I have... You know, here's the floor texture that we did, provided by our art team there at Sickhead, and you know, very beautiful high-resolution floor texture. Um, here's one of the walls on the east side, open and closed. Here's the north wall, open and closed. And these are blah, just blah, blah, 2D blah. textures that Tom's looking 2D at. 2D textures, but uh, notice they're like 3D looking, and that'll give you kind of the effect. Yeah. Um, so the so artist modeled those in a 3D tool and yeah. then simply exported them as 2D flat files. So it looks exactly looks 3D. Mostly. Mostly. And you can even do some more interesting effects there. Yep. So even though you're doing a 2D game, it doesn't have to feel like a 2D game. So we're going to open up the content project. And how we've hooked this up is you can just double click this sucker, and it will open up. And there you go. It's opened right up into the content pipeline project. If we hit build, it'll say, hey, you can build content. And everything's already set up here with the phone. So what we're going to do is we're going to add in content to this thing. 
So we're going to go uh, open file location just because it's going to simply open up this folder. We're going to dump these art files into here. Copy these suckers. This is very similar to what you would do uh, uh, in a content project. The difference being it will automatically add them the next to the content, content project. project. Yeah. Um, Tom's going to have to add these to the MGC by file yeah. um, by hand. Well, not, oh, do we well, not by hand. Drop? Well, not yet. That's uh, a, I totally want to get that feature, but we didn't get it in time. So, so we're just going to add it. So it's going to open up in this folder. We just select all our images here and say, hey, open those things. It added them. And just like XNA, once you add those things, it's already set up as a texture and everything. Uh, so we're done there. We're just going to save and close this thing. Get that out of the way. We don't need it at this point. So with that, actually, I'm going to close it because I don't want to forget. So with that, now, when we come in here and build, we'll see down here in the output window, you see it said here that it built all this content. This is the Visual Studio project. I'm actually telling the command line tool to build the content out, and it built it to an optimized format. It's done. And it's smart in that it doesn't, uh, if you just build again, it doesn't go back and do it again. It just says, hey, I skipped building these things, which so just like, not important yeah, in this just small like project, XNA. just like XNA. It's, it's not important you know, for this small project. If it builds them or not, it's not a big deal. But if you have some of the projects that we've dealt with where our build takes 40 minutes, the last thing you want is for it to build it every single time. So it takes care of not rebuilding that stuff, just like you would expect any other compiler thing to do. So with the, the art in place, let's talk about some of the code. So we're going to do, and we didn't remove this stuff here, so let's take care of that. So we're going to load this stuff into uh, a Texture 2D. And if you remember from the Pong example earlier, um, a Texture 2D is a Manu Games sprite, essentially. It, uh, it represents a 2D set of pixels. Um, uh, there's also a third dimension uh, that you can use um, called mipmaps. Um, and mipmaps are mainly used in 3D games, and they're smaller, scaled-down versions of it. So when you're loading a texture 2D, you could end up with the, the full texture and a set of smaller versions of it. And when those textures are then applied to a 3D model, as a 3D model moves into the distance, it will use the smaller, smaller textures automatically on the GPU. Um, this is one of the times that you find that uh, uh, an XNB file representing a texture can be way bigger than the original <laughs> JPEG. And the reason is that JPEG's very good at compressing certain things. Textures are compressed using a lossless uh, format called DXT, mm -hmm. um, which is nowhere near as efficient. But it is fantastically efficient for GPUs to load, process, and read. Right. Um, so um, it can be interesting. Some people used to complain a lot more when uh, disk space was less plentiful. Uh, why has this got bigger? It's made my game package bigger. Um, but in memory, it's the same amount of right. memory. So That's the key point, is that the, it's a format optimized to be the same, just as efficient on disk as it is in, in system memory and in GPU memory. And the GPU can directly render from it, whereas a JPEG, right. GPU can't render from. So but unless you're critical. very, very, very disk space constrained, it is best to just leave the uh, X and Bs in the DXT. Right. Format. So jumping back over here to the code, I'm going to paste in like all are loading of textures. So here's a bunch of texture 2Ds. We're going to load those, load those in here in a second, pasting it in because it's tedious to write. And same thing here. We're going to paste this in because it is tedious to write. Um, we're going to bring that down to the load content. Oh, I keep hitting scroll lock instead of home. I miss my keyboard. I know. We have some uh, small keyboards. So I'm personally used to the split keyboards, right. and it's very strange switching back to a straight one. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's the weirdo keyboard. I can't do that. So, so here in the code, basically, it's going to, for each of these walls, we're going to call the content manager, uh, which is something that's stock XNA stuff. It's the thing right. that loads content. It comes in and you say, hey, we're going to load a texture 2D, and the name of it is wall north open, which is the same thing that we just put into the content project. Right. Same name. We don't have to put a file extension. There aren't file extensions, because this is not a JPEG or anything else. Everything's an XNB. So this will load all these textures up, and we load up the ground texture. You know, and if, uh, yeah. So then, the next thing is we actually need to draw the room. So I'm going to bring this draw room function down, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit. Uh, this guy in here. I'm putting this draw room into a, separate into a separate function just to kind of separate things out and make it a little easier to understand. It's annoying to have to, like, scroll around and try to find something in a gigantic, you know, uh, source file or a gigantic uh, uh, function that has tons of different pieces into it, it's hard to find things. It's much easier to just break these things up into reusable little pieces. And, and the bigger you know the, the bigger the game gets, the uh, the more important it is to break these things up. Uh, right. 
Uh, just like it doesn't matter whether it's a game, it doesn't matter whether it's your ASPX website, but, you know, modularize these things. Um, if this game got, got any bigger, we would make a class and we would call map.draw or map renderer right. .draw. Um, the uh, Separating the, the data out from the mm. rendering is just as common as in, in games as it is uh, on a website. So right. you, can, you can MV, VM your games if you want to. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> but yeah, you can. So I, for, I realized I didn't add the map in here before, so let's add the map in. So I'm just initializing this map variable, map, and we, we're going to pass it a seed. Uh, Andy and I figured out something that was interesting. Environment. Wait, nope. It's environment. That's why not. A, isn't it? Oh, it's, it's, oh, it's going to give me the little pop-up. That's right. System. System's not in there. That's strange. And then we're going to use tick count. We realized we were talking about that in the random. We thought that random used like in turn the default seed would be, uh, you know, time, you know, uh, time date based, you know, time date, uh, uh, date time now. Right. But it's not. It's based on tick count. So we just realized that it was kind of interesting, which means that if you started this game two days apart at the exact same millisecond, you'd get the same map, which is interesting. So now we have the map in place. So let's look at draw room. So we just basically take the center of the viewport and we take the room, the current room. Here's sprite batch begin. That tells it, hey, we're going to about to draw some stuff. Here's our draw, which is very similar to what Andy was doing before. We want to center the ground into the room, so we kind of divide by the width and the height of the original texture to center it up. Uh, There's a little bit of math that makes it a little easier down here, and then we're going to draw these, draw the individual walls. So if the north room is at negative one, which means there's, you know, there's an actual room up there, then we draw the uh, north wall open. If not, we draw the north wall solid. And then, same thing, a little bit of math to place it in the right location, uh, things that you can look at in the code. And then the important part is call sprite batch end at the end so that it actually ends the batch. And that's actually where the real drawing occurs. Is at that point, it's like, OK, now I have everything I need. Let's go draw stuff. So that's an important little piece. So I think at this point, we have what we need there, right? Run it. Uh, yeah, let's run it here, because this is an important part to run it. And running a little slow, so I'll try to speed up a little bit. But nope, I keep hitting that button. Let's see. There we go. Yeah, we didn't. We haven't set up position yet, have we? Uh, no, I think it's something else. Let's see. Oh, you know what? You're not I calling draw room, are you? I think it's, uh, oh, that's right. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Andy's here to be my brain. There we go. Let's call draw room. That would be important. The, the most efficient code is the code that never gets called. I know. That room was rendering really quickly by not rendering at all. So there. It's drawing the room. And we still have comb flower blue back there. We'll get rid of that in a second. So it's rendering the room. Now, what's interesting about this, we're just rendering it. So uh, without any fancy you know, scaling or anything. So that means if I come over here and switch it from the 1080p emulator to this little four-inch emulator, which I opened up in the background. Let's change this to black because it's more fun, for me at least. And we run it on that emulator. You're going to see that the art's going to come off the edge of the room if I've calculated my everything correctly. So it's like, uh, whoa, what's that? That's weird. That's not going to work. So this is where you have two different phones with two different scales, and you need to adjust for those scales. And I think you've probably just failed Windows Phone certification. Probably. It's not going to be a very fun game. You're not going to make any money, and everybody's going to be sad. Sad puppies everywhere. One star review. One star review. Can't play the game. So this is where getting into scaling the, uh, scaling the UI here works. So what's going to happen here is I'm going to drop in little, some little stuff here, and I'll explain it here in a second. Drop, 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 and I want to put that in here, I think. Yeah. So what this does is, um, so what we're doing is we're taking the preferred back buffer height, which is the size of the, at that point, that's an easy way to kind of get the height of the, back of the actual window. And we're dividing by 1080. Why? Because we kind of decided that 1080 vertically is kind of our design size. And our width, it's variable, but we're not going all the way to 1920. And we do that because... There might be some scre screens that are not 16 by 9, they're smaller, but we don't want to go all the way to 4 by 3. So we kind of like, you know, we cut the baby in the middle here and we end up having like a little bit of both. Um, it generates a transform from it, just a regular matrix scale in X and Y, no scale in Z because there's no Z there. And then we, we calculate the new screen bounds based on that, that virtual scale. 
And that's important in order to know what the actual screen bounds is so that you can render things. So once we have that, we can come in here and take this transform. Do I have code for this? Or did I figure it out myself? Figure it out myself. So uh, with that, we come down here and uh, we want to change how our rendering works. And remember what I said, that the matrix here is, is just some math that when we multiply it by the thing we're drawing is going to move, scale, rotate to a different um, place and orientation. Mm. It's kind of like the TARDIS. It moves it to a different place in space and time. <laughs> Maybe not time, because remember we only did do the three dimensions. Exactly. So we're going to tell it, hey, we're going to change up our sprite batch begin here. There's a lot of null parameters, and we have a helper for this, but I might as well just show you how the XNA way does it. And this is pretty cool. This, uh, this gives you a really easy way to affect every single thing that's drawn inside this sprite batch. So once Tom has put the matrix that he generated <laughs> Enough in nulls. Here, um, yeah, unfortunately, the, uh, that overload uh, to get to the final parameter, yeah. you've got to type null for everything. Everything that's drawn in this sprite batch will be affected. So if we put a transform in there that says, move everything six pixels to the right and rotate it by four degrees, you don't change anything in the draw code. Uh, the draw code will all draw six pixels to the right and rotate it by four degrees. Exactly. So with this one line, basically, this one line change there, now when I run this thing, crossing my fingers, demo gods, demo gods, bring, bring, bring. Oh, I have errors. My little window's down here. What did I forget? Aha. Ah, the semicolon. Yes, the bane of programmers everywhere that misses the semicolon. Oh, I must have not cut and paste that very well, huh? It was too See, late. See, if, if we were doing that. this live, Tom, there'd be 100 people in the audience all yelling Grace, semicolon Grace. at you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, oh, I missed one little detail there. It's off to the side. The scale's getting better. We're closer, but not quite there yet. The other thing is, and this is why we had that, uh, that bounds, is we don't want to get the center from the, uh, from the viewport anymore because that's not the right center. Everything's scaled. What we want is we want the center from the virtual screen size. So we're going to get screen bound, center, and uh, vector 2. That peak window is very annoying. And so we're using the, the, the center of the screen from the virtual size instead. And by using that, it's going to pick the actual center of the room that we actually want to target. So run it here and look at that. Excellent. Perfectly centered. Nice Looks beautiful. And then if I stop here and switch back to the other one, which is the important part. You know, we come here and same thing. Yeah. But they're two different size phones. That this one's running at 1080p, the other one's running at, I don't know, it's yeah. a lot smaller resolution. And you know, that's an important part of this. If you don't do this from the beginning, you wait till the end. It'll be just a big pain to go through there and try to fix everything to work this way. So it's I'm, important we'll, to get early. I'll come back and talk a little about mm -hmm. screen sizes on uh, on module four. Right, um, exactly. And the many problems that uh, we can have. So yeah, <laughs> many problems they can introduce. All right. Yeah. So back to slides. Yeah, uh, what do we got? Rendering the HUD. Yes. Rendering the HUD, and this shouldn't take too long here. Um, so the, what's the HUD? The, most games have a, some form of HUD. You know. Uh, it usually displays information to the player. It's not interactive, but it's information that the game is providing to the player. There are things like help, health bars, targeting reticules, you know, the score. There's a couple other things I can't think of off the top of my head, but they're all things that are rendered on top of the regular scene. So it's you usually have like a 3D scene or a 2D scene, and they have this stuff on top that kind of overlays over it. So let's, let's actually just go and display the current room number here. For anybody who's not a game programmer who's watching this, HUD, HUD refers to you know, head-up display. Head-up display. I guess it's a military It's term. a military term that fighter pilots you know, have it projected onto the helmet. So it's kind of right. a, you know, if you think about it in a real world, you would not have the number of bullets floating here. You know, um, <laughs> you are currently in Microsoft Studios. Um, yeah. So I think you always have to suspend your disbelief for a little while there and right. uh, imagine that, uh, that there's a HUD. Right. So I opened up the content pro pipeline project again here. I'm going to do this time is I'm actually going to go a uh, new item. That brings up our little new content thing that we added. So you can select sprite font description here. And uh, I think we went with, uh, let's call it HUD. HUD font, that sounds fine. I don't think that's what I originally called it, but it's okay for now. And the sprite fonts work exactly the same as the ones in XNA. Right. It's, uh, it's a little XML file, and the XML file tells you which font to use, uh, how big it should be, uh, whether you've got bold italic on. Um, fonts in games are bitmap fonts. Um, they're rendered as sprites, so they're 2D textures. Uh, they're not scalable. 
Um, it's all generated at compile time. What essentially happens is you say to the content builder, I would like Comic Sans, because Comic Sans is the best game font ever. Uh, I would like it at 14 point, and I would like all of the following glyphs. And that's important because the more glyphs you put in, the bigger the content's going to get. So uh, if you only need uppercase uh, alphabetic letters, only put the uppercase alphabetic letters. Uh, if you're an application that runs in 12 different countries, then you're going to have to put a lot more um, characters in there, and that increases the size of that particular texture. So be careful, uh, including all of that. But at runtime, all we do is load the sprite, uh, sprite map, and then XNA renders those sprites for us automatically. It knows where each glyph is. It knows how big it is. It knows the spacing. It, I believe it even does a limited amount of kerning. Yes. Um, but you can't scale them. If you scale them, they will pixel scale, which you, means... You, you have some flexibility a yeah. little bit, but once you start going too far off, yep. it starts looking ugly. If it so gets you... too big, you end up pixely. If it gets right. too small, you start losing the thin lines right. in between. So it's best yeah. to render them one-to-one -one where possible. Usually. I'm not doing that here, but that's just because it's simpler for me to deal with it here. But it's something you can look at. So if you double-click on the sprite font here, it'll actually give us an option to open it up with something. We're just tell it to open it with Notepad. Uh, Oh, notepad's not fun yeah. for that. Yeah, format, you can uh, do the wrap. I can just go this way. Yeah. Usually it's assigned to something, but that's fine. There so we we're go. just bringing it up in here. So I'm going to change the font name to Sago UI because that's a very, I think Microsoft that, Microsoft. That is font, almost as good as Comic Sans, yes. <laughs> it's better. It's better. Uh, and we're going to render it at uh, 32 pixels in size. It's not exactly pixels there, but it's, it's pretty close. So we're going to save that. And then we're going to come back over here, and if we hit build real quick. You know, one other thing to point out here is that you'll notice that I changed, like, th this is a place where we extended past the XNA pipeline. The XNA pipeline, all your sprite fonts would always be compressed. And on some platforms, the compressed fonts look really bad. So what we did is, like, sometimes you have, don't have that much texture memory used by fonts. So it's pretty easy to just say, just don't compress the things. Um, so you can come in here and change it to color. It's just going to be a flat color. It's not going to be compressed. And that's fine, especially if you don't have a lot of fonts. Um, we find it that's become pretty useful as a request that people had, and we added it and was a pretty useful thing. Oh, how do I get out of this thing? Why am I not able to? Escape, I think. Uh, don't yeah. escape. Control one again. <laughs> uh, uh, Control four. I think F four, you see? That's me. Sorry, folks. I'm not. I'm more of a programmer and less of a broadcaster. So I don't know how these things work. All right, so we're going to save this thing. Don't forget to save it because then it won't work. And I can build real quick here if I want to. It'll give us a little build output, which is nice. Uh, and then I can close it because I don't need it. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up here and add the font in. Uh, we're going to call it HUD font instead because that's what we change it to. We're going to drop it in here into the content loading, you just put it anywhere here. And we called it actually HUD font, didn't we? And then, I haven't done that. I don't think it's smart enough to do that, is it? No, no, no. All right. Programming is a lot of typing. Yeah, luckily I copied, I got, you know, most of this stuff worked out, huh? Probably could have done more. So it's gonna add HUD font in there. And then uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go down to render this thing. What we're going to do is, because it's kind of separate from the rest of the scene, we're going to do a separate function. So private uh, void draw HUD. Drop our code in there. Everything is beautiful. Totally worked. This time I am going to remember to call it. Good. We're going to call it after the room so that it renders after the room on top of things. And I think that's all. Yep, that's all. So Sprite Font has a whole bunch of sorting options. If you remember, we said when you call N, that's when it calls it. Um, you, can, uh, you can tell it to draw them in the order you gave them. You can mm -hmm. tell it to sort them by the textures. You can, you can actually pass it in a depth parameter, uh, which kind of stacks things up, mm -hmm. um, kind of in layers. And then when you call end, it will actually sort them all by the orders. Um, in general, it's uh, fairly efficient to just say, you know, the default is to sort it by the order that we did them in, and that's why Tom can say, right. draw this after I've drawn the other thing. Right. And in here, the same thing with the draw HUD thing, sprite batch begin, same deal. We're passing in the screen X form. Again, with the font even, it'll scale it. Um, we're just writing a little bit of formatting some text here for what we want to put in there, the room index plus one, just to give you, 
instead of as a programmer, I would start it at zero, but you know, gamers they want to start things at one. So it calls draw string, which is another function on Sprite Batch to actually draw it out, and we placed a little bit up down there, up in the corner, and that's it. So if, now if we run this thing, and I did everything right. There we go. Up here in the corner, we have room 80, 81 written. Can't do anything with it because you can't move yet, but it's mm -hmm. there. So we have a little bit of a HUD. So back to slides. So let's talk about inputs and animation. This is the last section here. So inputs. So in this game, you know, in this game, we're basically doing a touchscreen kind of game. And a lot of times with that kind of stuff, it's usually easier to kind of design things around input concepts. And in this case, we're talking about uh, buttons. So what we're going to do is we're going to build, a, we have a small button class that I have here on the side that I'm going to drop in. And all it does is it encapsulates a couple of concepts of being able to, it, capturing the input and rendering and uh, just puts them separate because it is kind of a separate thing. So we're going to have a bunch of buttons. It's easier to kind of separate it out instead of like cut and pasting a bunch of times. So all it's going to do is touch against a, uh, a location, a rectangle location on the screen. Again, it uses Sprite Batch to render. And uh, this can be extended to other devices to support other, other input types. And for this game, we're just going to basically add buttons and the different doorways to say, hey, these are the directions you can move in. So let's drop down and do that. Uh, wrong window. Here we go. So here... So one thing to always remember if you're running a touch game while well, Tom drags his art in, and since you've all seen this before, uh, he's going to just drag the art into his content project and load it up, um, is remember that people's fingers are much bigger than a mouse. Um, so artwork that uh, is an icon, something like at the top of Visual Studio or Microsoft Word, um, those tiny little icons, they're just not going to work on a phone. Um, Especially somebody who's got you know big fat fingers like me. I'm going to hit three of your buttons at the same time, uh, and that's not what multi-touch is all about. So, Tom's got some nice big high-res uh, fonts here. Uh, sorry, not fonts, sprites. Um, and the other thing is that we're spacing them out. In, in this case, because it's touch, uh, we don't need a virtual gamepad. We don't need any uh, fancy controls. We can actually put the buttons in the place on the screen where you want it to go. So we're going to put the buttons actually in the doorways. Um, it makes the game more interesting because you're pressing the, the, direc the direction you want to go. Uh, other options you could use in this, we could swipe. Um, I, mm. we could, we're, the, there's a whole gesture library in there. We could realize that there's a door to your right. We could do swipe white, right. Swipe right, excuse me, swipe right <laughs> and left. Um, you could use the tilt, um, tilt left, tilt right. Um, you'll cool. see that uh, DirectX has a sample, which is a marble maze that uses exactly that kind of uh, thing. So the, the kind of controls that you'll use on a phone are always going to be different. Um, some games try to make the virtual pad and give me a nod when you've got all those. In. Oh, yeah, we're ready. You're so, ready? Okay. So I've stopped rambling now. Yeah, just stop rambling now. <laughs> so the, but the button class I dropped in here, very simple. Keeps the re rectangle location for the touch. It's easy for us to decide where the, the touch point is. We keep uh, you know, a texture for it. We store the last touch ID. Uh, on Windows Phone, you get an ID for where you're touching on the screen. And on the secondary touch, you get a different ID. So because of that, I can use that to determine, is this the second touch, or is this still the first one? Um, a little bull to know whether it's pressed or not. Um, simple stuff. We get past the texture. We build a location from the texture size and the position. Um, you know, and the helper function here for, hey, was this thing pressed? Uh, it goes through there and does a little bit of logic to decide was the location to press or not. And if it was pressed, it returns true. If not, it returns false. Very straightforward stuff. And a little helper function to draw, even though there really isn't a lot to draw. It was easy to put it in there. And this could be expanded to more complex things like drawing differently pressed and off states or having different textures for pressed states and off states. Um, there's a lot of things you can do here, but it's simple. Didn't want to get into this too deeply. So with that in place, I think everything builds right now, right? Yes, yeah, so let's drop in some code into actually using this stuff. So uh, in the game, we're just going to add it straight to the game class. We're going to add these buttons up in here. Bring this sucker down. There we go. Buttons, buttons, buttons. Then we're going to come in here and initialize these. I'm not going to talk about this too much because it's basically the same as what we're doing with the texture. It's not really a lot to talk about. There we go. UI buttons are being loaded now, textures, and then it builds the button class, just passing in a little math to position them. And then uh, what we're going to do is we're going to put in actually handling of the input. 
And then it, there are a lot of uh, UI engines that will handle this kind of stuff for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you're probably finding games that there's nothing quite as rich as Windows Forms or one of those, uh, just because you don't have the richness of controls or input or output. Uh, you generally don't need a data-bound um, grid um, in the middle of your game. But you know, you might need it on the leaderboard screen. Um, there. So you'll find in, uh, in game engines, so if you're looking at the Unities and the Unreal of the World, they'll have a UI engine which is as complex as about you can get. Um, uh, much easier to do that, but in X and A, um, I think there's a couple out there that you can use. Right. Um, but it's. Uh, I think we're going to cover games, that here in, a, in the next module. For simple games, so. you'll uh, you'll just roll your own. Yeah. So here's the update loop here, and what we added in here is we call the touch panel and say, "Hey, touch panel, give me the state." This is telling you, "Hey, what's the state of the curtain buttons?" So we grab it here one time instead of grabbing it multiple times. In fact, it's important if you call get state multiple times, you'll actually get different states. It'll say, "Okay, you called again, so get the next set of state." So you just want to call it one time in an update loop and not kind of do it over and over again. Um, so we grab it, then we pass it to each button, say, "Hey, here's the touch state. You know, was this button pressed?" You know, so for the north button, it calls it. Was it pressed? It returns true. It was pressed. It calls the map and says, "Hey, map." Move player north. That's the code that we talked about earlier. And uh, you know, here's an empty little delegate because we aren't going to do anything with it uh, at the moment. But you know, we get the information at least. It got called back. It says, "Hey, the move happened." Uh, and then the same thing for the other directions. Then we come down here since the UI is part kind of rendered in the HUD. You could probably make it a separate category and have render UI separately. But I've just put it in the HUD because it's easy. So in the HUD, come down here. We basically say, "Hey, if the current room has a north room." then draw the north button. So we just turn the buttons off if you can't go in that direction just to make it easier for the player not hitting the wrong buttons. So very straightforward. So now, if we did everything right and hit F5, we pop this thing up, and I didn't do that again. I keep hitting that camera button. Uh, you'll see now we have arrows. Now we're pressing it, and you see the number is changing, right? Yep. And you see the wall just changed when I moved up there. Yep. But it's not... You know, the, you, there's no animation. It's, it's kind of boring, but you're getting, you're actually seeing something. There's, this is a start yeah. of gameplay. So what's happening here, if it's not completely obvious, is that we're actually moving rooms. It's just that every room looks the same, and at 60 frames a second, you don't see a flash. You don't see anything yeah. in between. So we're really moving from room to room here, um, and so we need some way of either telling the rooms apart or giving some animation, or you know, so one thing you could do is you could change the floor color so that that would be obvious. Um, but you know, we thought that uh, actually showing you move from room to room would be a, a, a nicer right. thing to do. Oh, and here's a little thing that I, I forgot to mention, which is important. Um, we're running at the at the the game that's actually using the one to one resolution uh, there. But if we were running on the other one, and I try to hit the button, it wouldn't hit because. The input comes in at one scale, but the virtual screen is at another scale. And it's like I'm touching here, but it's actually hitting the input over there. So they wouldn't hit. So a trick here, and I don't know if a lot of people know this, but a trick here is to actually change that in initialization. Basically here, where touch panel has display width and display height. And it's really curious. I didn't understand it for a while. But what it does is by telling it what my virtual display size is, it will then automatically scale all touch inputs by that virtual display size. So by just telling it, hey, my screen bounds is this and my screen height is that, internally, every input you get will automatically be scaled. So if you go from the different devices, the inputs are scaled. And that's a, an important little piece. Um, you don't have to like do the scale in every test. It'll internally handle it. Cool. So that's a little detail there that I almost forgot. So uh, let's go back to the slides here. And I think it's the last code slide. Yep. So uh, room animation. So, as Andy was saying, it would be very boring if it was kind of static. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some simple logic for scrolling one room out when you leave and scrolling the other room in. That happens over time. Uh, we switch states between, you know, scrolling in and scrolling out. And we have, uh, we use a simple offset in our rendering in order to make, move the room around on the screen. Uh, and during this, we try to disable the inputs so that, you know, the player isn't hitting other inputs while the sc screen is moving around. So that gives it a little bit of dynamicism. You see everything moving. So let's go back to code here. So uh, to do that, we don't need any art or anything. We're going to do is grab this little chunk of variables here. We're going to dump that in here. So this is just uh, some state that I need for doing this. The current scroll position, what room we're scrolling out of, 
uh, where do we want the end position for the scroll out to be, which is important to know what direction and everything, so we calculate that ahead of time. Um, what room we're scrolling into and the new scroll position. You could easily do like, hey, I'm going to go through a warp window and scroll into a room that's not even adjacent. It doesn't really matter. You can do anything there. So it's a lot of flexibility in it, but we're only using it for just scrolling between the neighboring rooms. So here we're going to grab the code for actually doing the scroll logic. Uh, and this sort of stuff we're adding now is where we're getting into the polish. This is where we're saying, you know what, the game actually did kind of play before. I really was moving rooms. Right. But um, if you show that to the guy you want to get a job from, he's going to say, you know, yeah, it's kind of boring. Move. I thought the whole point of video games was being pretty mm -hmm. and being active. So um, always good stuff to put into the game. So real simple here, uh, every update loop here, we're just calculating the new scroll position, which is just we're passing time, we're scaling it by two because we want it to move, run a little faster. We're clamping it to zero to one because that's all the, the range that we need. Um, so you have the scroll, if uh, the scroll, again, magic numbers, if the scroll out room isn't negative one, then we're still scrolling out. Uh, and if the scroll position becomes one, that means we were done scrolling out. So at that point, we disable the scroll out room and we set the, reset the scroll position to zero. And then on the next loop, it'll you know, start animating the next piece, which that's going to fall into here to scroll in room. If it's not negative one, same kind of logic. So this is basically the logic that, that cycles between scrolling in and scrolling out and manages that little bit of state. But it doesn't do any rendering, it's just doing the update. And scroll position is kind of a percentage. It's between zero and one. So zero means I am not scrolled in or out, and one means I am scrolled all the way in right. or all the way out. Right. You see this a lot in video games. You see, you see a zero to one range meaning everything's done or right. everything's not done. A common thing that we always do. So here in the, draw, the drawing of the room, we're going to drop in some code here. So if we're actually scrolling out, we're going to say, okay, well, what room are we scrolling out of? And then we're going to do a little lerp function here. Lerp is just an interpolation from one state to another. In this case, it's an interpolation of a vector two, so a two-dimensional vector. We're going to lerp between a zero position to the output position over, you know, this, this scroll variable is controlling that. And it generates then a new position, which is the offset. And since we, you know, smartly put this little center point here, we offset that center point. By offsetting that center point, and since all our rendering is based off the center point, that means that everything is going to move around. So there's the ground based off the center point. This, there is the, uh, the rooms based off the center point. That's going to scroll that around. And then, uh, you know, once it goes to scroll in room, it does the same thing. The logic's a little different, so that's why there's two there. There might be a smarter way to do it, but I just did it this way. Um, and if none of those states are on, it just renders as normal, like the, the things right in the scene. Now, one thing I did notice that I forgot here, and I'll have to jump to some other code to grab it. Bear with me. Uh, so if you remember when we were changing the scales earlier and uh, Tom forgot to set the center, what we did is we saw the world kind of offset into the corner because he hadn't set the center up. And that's essentially all we're doing here. We're, we're saying the center of the screen is moving based on time off to the left. And since all our rendering is based on where the center, in my air quotes, is, uh, it moves away over to the left or it moves away to the right. And we move that in the up, down, the four directions. Uh, if you had a more complex map, obviously you're going to have to uh, change those directions. Um, you, can, uh, you could fade the screen while you did it. There's a whole bunch of, uh, of different things. Uh, I think in the next module, Tom's going to add some sound effects while we're doing it. Um, yeah, you know, give people interesting things to do. Um, speed's an interesting one. How fast should you scroll it on or off? If you do it too fast, it, it's jarring. If you do it too slow, you're going to... You know, it is amazing. You know, I did play. spend a good amount of time you know, uh, sitting there scrolling going, mm, I don't quite like that. Let me change this number. Mm, I don't quite like that. That's where you're being able to start the game, test something, come back out is important to have that loop tight so that you don't waste a lot of time staring at the screen waiting for it to start back up. That's why you don't shut down the emulators because it takes forever to come back up. You want to have that quick loop that you can get there. So I pasted a bunch of code here that I forgot to paste in earlier, which basically is uh, that those callbacks in the movement, those callbacks allow us to do other things, and in this case, animation. So here, we're saying if the player moves north, reset the scroll position, set the scroll out room to the current room index, uh, set the scroll out end to this virtual position where I want it to scroll out and scroll off the screen. Uh, scroll in room is the next room, and then the scroll start, which is again off the screen in the other direction. And this is, there are different directions. It has different magic numbers in there with the direction, but yeah. these magic numbers are based on the virtual screen size. So that tells it how to do the scroll. So, here is the moment of truth. Did I drum roll, that? everybody. Drum roll. I, I'm pretty sure if I did a drum roll on the table, the, the, the AV guy would not would be not happy. Would not be happy. So, so I have my arrows. I'm going to hit a direction, 
and everything ran but the arrows. I forgot to animate that, so let's go do that real quick. So remember we talked about that center position, right? Yep. Actually, no, that's no, not I think, what the position no, is. I it's think, a different yeah. issue. Don't we just hide the arrows? Yeah, we hide the yeah. arrows. That's what we need to do. So okay. while it's scrolling, we, uh, uh, we could scroll the arrows with the room, but uh, it's probably better to remove them because you don't want people right. pressing on those buttons. Um, it's always part of a, a good UI to disable or hide things when people can't touch them. So uh, we're pretty much going to say if we're scrolling right now, don't bother drawing any of the buttons. Yeah, and that's something that, uh, you know, you could do this in fancier ways and you could fade things in or out. We're just disabling them. There's a lot of things you could potentially do here. No. That's not what you want to do. There we nope. Go. Fat fingering all these things. Yeah. Right, so now if we run this, we should have the buttons disappear. Which you saw when it was, the button was on there, it looked disturbing. Yep. It's like, what's going on there? I don't understand. Um, so now when I do this thing, the button's turn off, they turn back on, and we have some room scrolling. It's and that looks like a game to me, Tom. Yeah. It looks like we're pretty much there for... There's one little detail, though, that I didn't like when I saw it. It's like, you know what? It feels really robotic. It's kind of like moving very smoothly and stuff. And it, here's an important little lesson in polish, is um, you don't have to just linearly interpolate, you know, like that. Uh, you can easily come in here and improve that just by a little bit. So we did this interpolation. Instead of doing this just scroll position, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this little helper that I have. Uh, this is a little class called helpers that I added in here while you, you were talking. This is a little function called ease in out. So easing functions are kind of common in animation uh, and those kinds of things are important here. So seeing an ease in out function just does a little bit of math, nothing crazy complex. Uh, and we can probably we can probably draw it here. If I yeah. uh, was it control two, let me draw it on my screen here. If you switch uh, switch switch eh. over to my screen, you're going to end up with a. Uh, there we go. So linear interpolation looks like this. It goes in a straight line. God, drawing's not very good. The easy and out function that Tom's got is going to look something like this. And so what that does is, it, uh, instead of going from a zero to moving straight away, it goes from a, a slow zero here, and it slowly builds up speed as it goes along, and then we're moving quite fast, and then as we're coming towards a stop, we slow down, and then when we get to here, we're back at a, a velocity of zero. Yeah, and it's, it's a lot nicer function. There's tons of different kinds of easing functions. Read up on them, they're very interesting. Uh, in this case, as he described, if the step is less than... 0.5, we do one math operation. If not, we do the other. Pretty straightforward. Um, you'll have to just look at the code to figure that out. So now if we run this thing, I think we'll have enough frame rate here to kind of see the feel of it. So now when we run it, you can see how it like accelerates up and then kind of slows down as it comes in there. It's kind of subtle. We can make, probably make it a little bit more pronounced, but it feels a little bit more gamey, at least to me, is that, that kind of change. So that's, at this point, I think we're at the end of I think of we this. are at the end, and yeah. we're... We're a little over, so everybody's. Oh yeah, uh, everybody's real glad. Sorry if we've uh, held your up your cup of tea at eleven <laughs> o'clock. So let's wrap up here. So we created a brand new project from scratch. We built a. We brought in a map room and structure. We set up some inputs. We set up some rendering, some basic gameplay, and we got the thing moving around. Did a little bit of polish easing and stuff. So at this point, you kind of have something that's starting to feel kind of exciting and as a game, but there's still a lot of pieces missing. So um, we're going to wrap up for this, uh, take a break, and if you have any questions, put them up there in chat, and we'll get to them as soon as uh, we get back from our break. Thanks, guys. Bye.